this is going to be a really cool series. As Pastor Jennifer said, if you've got something burning your heart, I mean, drop a question in there. That's, and it's, it's challenging to us. I'm not going to lie to you. So the first question, you ready? Yeah. Question number one that we're going to build the entire message around today was this. This was dropped in the box. If Jesus lives in our hearts, why are demons still attacking us? Come on, great question, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to break this down today, and we're going to spoon feed you with a message from the Word of God today. So that's a fantastic question, and um, we want to take every angle of this question because it's a big one. It's a big one. There's a lot in there. There's the word demons in there. So like three-quarters of us went, are they talking about that today? Seriously? So we're going to cover a lot of ground, but here's the first thing that I want to say. If Jesus lives in our hearts, then why are demons attacking us? And here's the thing. Um, the answer, first, of, first and foremost, can be found in the question itself. Because Jesus lives in our hearts, that's why demons attack us. Are you with me? It, it's found right in there. It's because Jesus lives in our hearts. It's because we're his. It's because we belong to him that we are not off limits. Now, here's the thing. Because of the question that was submitted, I've, we've got to take every angle of what they may be thinking when they wrote it. And here was what I, what I felt was inferred. If we just finished Easter and you guys just told us that it is finished, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins to break the power of the enemy, then if he lives in us, then why are we still a target for the enemy? Didn't Jesus take care of that? And the answer is yes, but at the same time, he didn't take us out of this world. He left us in this world, and he gave us power to overcome the enemy just like he did. Here's the deal, guys. If, if Jesus is um, not off limits to the enemy, then why do we think that we are? I mean, we look all throughout the word, through his ministry, through his time, on the way to the cross, that he was a target for the enemy. But here's the great news, that Jesus showed us how to overcome the enemy right? He's empowered us while we're still here. So the answer is found in this. Jesus lives in our hearts and therefore you're still going to get attacked. Isn't that great news? The great news comes in the fact that we don't have to not be aware of what he does and how he does it because the Bible tells us that we're supposed to be um, aware of his devices and therefore we can see him coming and we can destroy the works of the enemy. Here's the deal. Jesus is fair game. We're fair game. It is finished does not mean that we're off limits. In fact, it actually means that you're a greater target than ever. Why? Because the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Look at this verse. Satan comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Now listen, I want you guys to hang with us today. We're going to follow a lot of ground, and we're going to go into some, some deep places, and it may even get you going, I don't know if I believe that. Here's the deal. Whether you believe it or you don't believe it, it's still it still doesn't change it. It's in the word and therefore it is. So we're going to teach you some things today about the enemy and how he comes and why he comes, especially if we're Christians today, we are not off limits. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy, to steal our joy, to kill our walk with the Lord, to, to, to destroy our victory and our homes and our marriages, but we are victorious through Christ. That's right. Guys, you ready today? Yeah. Come on, let's get into this. 1 Peter 5, 8, the Bible says your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Let me ask you a question today. So why does the devil come after us trying to devour and destroy us? That's the question. Why does he do that? Simple. And before we go into that question, we need to understand this. Our relationship with the enemy, what does that mean? It means that the devil hates your guts. Come on, now's a good time to say amen to somebody. He, he doesn't like us. He hates us. Why? There's three simple reasons I want to give you today. Number one, watch this. Genesis 126 says that you and I were made in the very image of God himself. So you know what that means? Since he hates God, he hates us. Why? Because we were made in the image of God, according to Genesis 126. The second reason that he does not like us is because now we are worshipers of of God. Do you realize BC before Christ you were a worshiper of Satan? Why? Because you did it his way, not his way. Come on, guys. As a matter of fact, you were not only a worshiper of him, you were also a worshiper of yourself. 
because we wanted our way right away. Come on, it sounds like Burger King. Can I get a witness to somebody? We wanted our way right away. But I want you to understand me. Here's why the enemy does not like us, because all of a sudden, you are now a worshiper of God instead of a worshiper of yourself. So here's the deal. You became a believer. In other words, you became a Christian, which means Christ-like, and you are no longer like the enemy, now you are like him, and the devil does not like that. Can you say amen? All right, guys, let's go further. Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to go into the video because here's the deal. The um, question was submitted, and it used the word demons. And, and, and we've talked to people before, and they're like, I don't know if I believe in demons. I don't know if I believe this whole Satan thing. And here's the deal. It was so life transforming for me when I realized that there was a wrestling in the spirit for my soul mm -hmm. that helped me and let me tell you why it helped me because I was a basket case I was a mess if I hear a mess <laughs> you have thoughts that are not right and you're thinking where in the world did that come from right we did an entire study on everything comes from our heart and the deal is is that we have to understand that what we're going through and what we're living through even though we were left here even though we belong to Christ we were left here and we have work to do for the Lord but we're also targets for the enemy to get us off that path right and so we really want to understand the word demons was used in there um, we've been talking about Satan so to best understand this war between God and Satan um, and us and Satan because we're gods we're going to show you just a quick video kind of breaking it down having us understand that Satan who was once Lucifer was a created being he was a created being he was a created angel in heaven so I want you to watch this video real quick because it says everything and it gives us a real good firm foundation and we're going to jump off of that and have us understand why is it that we're not off limits to the enemy even though Jesus Christ lives in us let's take a look at this video how why and when did Satan fall from heaven Satan's fall from heaven is symbolically described in Isaiah 14, 12-14 and Ezekiel 28, 12-18. While these two passages are referring specifically to the kings of Babylon and Tyre, they also reference the spiritual power behind those kings, namely Satan. These passages describe why Satan fell, but they do not specifically say when the fall occurred. What we do know is this, the angels were created before the earth. Satan fell before he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden. Satan's fall, therefore, must have occurred somewhere after the time the angels were created and before he tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Whether Satan's fall occurred hours, days, or years before he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden, Scripture does not specifically say. The book of Job tells us, at least at that time, Satan still had access to heaven and to the throne of God. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Apparently at that time, Satan was still moving freely between heaven and earth, speaking to God directly and answering for his activities. Whether God has discontinued this access is a matter of debate. Some say Satan's access to heaven was ended at the death of Christ. Others believe Satan's access to heaven will be ended at the end times war in heaven. Why did Satan fall from heaven? Satan fell because of pride. He desired to be God, not the servant of God. Notice the many I will statements in Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. Ezekiel 28, 12 through 15 describes Satan as an exceedingly beautiful angel. Satan was likely the highest of all angels, the anointed cherub the most beautiful of all of God's creation. But he was not content in his position. Instead, Satan desired to be God, to essentially kick God off his throne and take over the rule of the universe. Satan wanted to be God, and interestingly enough, that is essentially what Satan tempted Adam and Eve with in the Garden of Eden. How did Satan fall from heaven? Actually, a fall is not an accurate description. It would be far more accurate to say God cast Satan out of heaven. Satan did not fall from heaven, rather, Satan was pushed. Got In that awesome video, very informative. Man, I love the fact that he said Satan did not fall from heaven, he was kicked out. He received the right foot of fellowship, amen? 
because he tried to ascend above God, and therefore God kicked him out. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9 that when the devil was kicked out, he took a third of the angels with him. Now, here, let me share something with you. I've got good news right on the tail end of that. That tells me if there's a third of the angels that left with him, there's two-thirds that are still on your side. They're outnumbered two to one. Can you say amen? amen. Now, let me share something with you. Those fallen angels are what we, you and I now refer to as demons or devils. And Ephesians 6 calls them spiritual forces or powers of this dark world. Now, watch this. This world was not always a dark place. Do you realize, according to Genesis chapter 1, it used to be a perfect place? Watch this. Made by a perfect God. It was filled with light. It was filled with love and life. As a matter of fact, everything was in order. Today, we live in a world of disorder. Everything's out of order, but at one time, the world was a place of order. As a matter of fact, it had God's stamp and a seal of approval on everything that he made. Why? Because when he made it, God said, it is good. That's what earth used to look like. So We look in Genesis 1 and 2 and we find out that the world was once perfect. That was God's original design and this is how this story went down and many of you know it but I'll just recap it real quickly we see that that God used to come down and and talk with Adam and Eve the Bible says that they would walk in the cool of the day that they were friends that there was fellowship between God and man and so we discussed that a, a few weeks ago how um, God's desire is to be is to be worshiped and loved by us but he also desires to be a part of our lives all a part of our lives to lead our lives and as a result of what happened in the garden, you know this, that the next time we see Satan, so we see in the video that he was cast out of heaven, then the next time that we see him is in the book of Genesis, in the beginning. I love that the Bible starts with, in the beginning, God. Yeah. Everything has to start with God. Right. Everything in our lives should start with God or it's out of order. So we look in the word and it says, in the beginning, God created. And so he goes through those six days of creation. And in those days, he created Adam. And out of Adam, he created Eve. And so there they were in fellowship with God, loving God. They had a perfect um, scenario, perfect situation, um, perfect climate, perfect world. And he said, listen, you can have anything in this garden. All of it is yours. All of it is yours. Adam uh, um, named all the animals, and, and God gave him a helpmate, which was Eve. And then as a result of that, here comes in verse, uh, I'm sorry, in chapter 3, Genesis 3, here comes Satan. So he comes to the earth as a serpent, as the video says. And uh, as the word of God says in Genesis 3, he came and he tempted Eve with the one thing that God said you can't have. He said, you can have everything in this garden except don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat it, you will surely die. Now, I know that that sounds a little bit like God loaded a gun and stuck it on a table and told a bunch of kids not to touch it. Anybody with me? But we have to understand that perfect will was there. That tree was placed there so that we could understand that obedience brings joy, brings peace. And it gives us the opportunity, it gives us the opportunity to do it our way, but we don't have to. Every day of our lives, we are presented with, here's God's way, oh, but there's this over here. And so we look at in the garden, and what happened was this, is that serpent, the serpent came, or Satan came to Eve and said, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, you'll become like him. One more time, you'll become like God. And so we offered it to Eve, and Eve took it and gave it to her husband, and her husband heard the direction of God but didn't stop it. He sat back, and he hung out, and he let it happen. And as a result of that, sin entered the world. Our own will entered the world, and we decided that we were going to do things our way instead of God's way. And as a result of that, then the perfect will of God, that perfect place, became a place of sin and disorder and violence. We see that right after that, that 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 God actually had to kill the first uh, animal to be able to cover them up because when their eyes were open, when they took that fruit, they looked down and they saw that they were naked. They had always been naked, but all of a sudden they're like, hey, what's that, right? So that's what happened in the garden. And now all 
of a sudden, everything's changed. And now God has to reorder the world. He has to reorder how it's going to work on earth. And this is exactly what he did in Genesis 3. Hey, guys, let's look at Genesis 3, 14 through 22. This is the reordering of creation after the fall of man in the garden. Now, look, we're going to cover a lot of ground, so hang tight. The Bible says, then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. All right, let me stop there. The devil has no children unless you are a follower of the enemy. Therefore, you are a a child of the devil. Remember, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, said, you're of your father, the devil. Therefore, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, guess what? God is not your father. The devil is. Are you with me? All right, let's go on. It says, I will cause hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Let's go on. Then he said to the woman, all right, ladies, this is for you. You can thank Eve. I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy. You can thank her when you get to heaven. Come on, guys. And in pain, you will give birth. How many know that that's still happening today, right? And you will desire to control your husband. I can stop there and preach a whole sermon, but I'm going to keep on. But he will rule over you. All right. Can I say the end? But he will rule over you. All right. I had to say that twice. And then to the man, come on, get, it's notice, setting everything in motion. And to the man, he said, since you listened to your wife and you ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. And guys, you ever planted anything? Man, you watered it. You, you, you did everything you could and nothing came up. Or something pretty like a rose bush comes up and it's full of thorns. Come on, that's a curse. From Adam all the way back in the book of Genesis. The Bible says the ground is cursed because of you. All of your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you. Come on, the rose bush, orange trees, everything, thorns and thistles. Though you eat of its grain by the sweat of your brow. In other words, we got to work hard. Come on, guys. By the sweat of your brow. Will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made? You were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Do you realize if you were to dig up some people from the ground that have been there forever, guess what? There are nothing but dust because we were made from dust, and according to the Bible, we will return to dust. Now, guys, I want you to understand me real quickly. We still live in the same type of world. Would you say amen? We, all we have to do is look around. We find out that we live in a world that has not gotten any better, but instead the world has gotten a whole lot worse. Would you agree with that? Do you realize the Bible does not say it's going to get any better? The Bible continues to say that it's going to get worse and worse and worse. I know some of you are really excited to hear that today. But let, let me share with something with you. Let me keep going. Do you realize all we got to do is turn on the TV and see how bad the world is? If we turn on the TV, we, we read the news app on our phone, we find that the world is filled with mischief, malice, and murder. Come on, guys. Apostasy, abortion, and anarchy are everywhere all around us. But here's what happened. Satan was given dominion over the earth when Adam fell into sin. Remember, sin and then shame separated Adam from a holy God. So therefore, when Adam sinned, he forfeited his right as a ruler, and Satan became the authority here on earth. Is that biblical? You better believe it. Let me give you some Bible. You ready? Watch this. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 19, and also 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, that Satan is the god of this world. Let's go on. Ephesians 2, 2 says he's the prince of the power of the Air. John 12, 31 says that the devil is the ruler of this world. But hold on, it's going to get better. Get ready. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 6, 12 says this, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. 
Now, s- some of us, you read the news, and you're like, mm, that's just evil. That's just evil. Some, somebody does something to somebody, that's just evil. There's evil in the world, right? Because we're not all submitted to God. The Bible says, and we're going to end today's message with a, a, a verse that is so powerful in James 4, 7. It says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. Many people have not submitted themselves to God. And therefore, they're being controlled by the enemy. Does that make sense? So we're living in this world, and here's this this war and this fight and all of this going on. And we have the ability to not be influenced by it, but instead to influence our world, right? Because we've got Christ in us. Satan is the accuser. That is his job. The question was, if we have Jesus in our hearts, Why is it that we're attacked by the enemy? Why is it that he's coming after us? And here's the thing. What he does is he accuses us. He accuses us. You've heard that voice before. He may not show up as a serpent talking to us, hanging out. But he comes to us in accusation. You're not good. You're not good enough. You messed up again. God's not going to forgive you this time. There's no point in going to church, being a part of a church, because you know what? You're a hypocrite. You want to do those things, but you don't do those things. And you are a hypocrite. Is anybody with me? He comes as an accuser. He comes as a thief. He steals away your dreams. He steals away your hopes. Anybody? He's a deceiver. He tells you that God doesn't love you. He tells you that you're not accepted. He deceives us on a daily basis, and he's the tempter, right? He tempts us into sin. He tempts us away from God's perfect will. And I want to show you this real quickly, and babe, I'm just going to go with this real quick. We didn't talk about this, but that's all right. Here we go. Here's my trusty little cones. I love these things. I get so much out of them, worth the 10 bucks for each one. Here's the deal. We have one path that God wants us to take. And he tells us that in his word, right? He tells us how to live. Let's take a look at Mark 4, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 4. Go to Matthew 4 real quickly. The temptation of Jesus. This verse right here, guys, will mess you up. It messed me up. Because let's take a look at what it says. Then Jesus was led by who? Anybody? Does that alarm any of you? Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy. Why is that? You see, I believe that the person that submitted that is wondering whether or not if they belong to Christ, then why is it that they're not off limits? And here's what we need to understand. He didn't pull us out of this world. He left us in this world. Let's take a look at this next verse real quickly. I love this. Before Jesus left this earth, he prayed to his Father in heaven about his disciples and about those, of, those that would follow him then and those that follow now, which is us, right? And this is what he said. Jesus looked towards heaven and he prayed. This is before he went to the cross. Father, the time has come. I am coming to you. I will not stay in this world any longer, but they, they will still be in this world. Holy Father, keep them safe by the power of your name. You see, if you're wondering if Jesus accomplished anything on the cross, if we're still uh, um, attacked by the enemy on a daily basis, the answer to that is yes. We get the power of his name that we sang about today. We get the power of his name. Nothing can stand by the power of Jesus' name. Listen, I have given them your teaching. What teaching is he talking about? Back to Matthew 4, the Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted. And it was there that Jesus fasted for 40 days. He was preparing. We didn't even look at this until you look ahead of it. He was preparing for his earthly ministry. And he was fasting for 40 days. And he got to that mountain and Satan showed up and tempted him tempted him to bow his knee, tempted him to, to, to say that I'll give everything up to be what? To be like what the enemy was doing, just tempting constantly. And so we take these four opportunities where he said to Jesus, cast yourself down or take these rocks and turn them into bread. And he tempted Jesus in every single turn. This is what Jesus said. It is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. And this is what he was doing. According to that scripture, go back to the other one, guys. This is what he said. I have given them your teaching. 
Why did the Spirit lead Jesus to the mountain to be tempted? Why? Because one day it would be recorded in the Word. And we would be able to see that when Satan comes to us, that we defeat him the same way Jesus defeated him, and that is this. It is written. It is written. You see, if you're wondering if Jesus accomplished anything, if we're still under the attack of the enemy, please understand this. We're not under anything. We are not under our circumstances. We are not under the problems of our lives. We have authority in Christ, using his name, to put him in his place. He gave us his teaching. What was that? Hey, guys, I want you to see this. I'm on this mountain. I'm being tempted, and here's how you defeat him when he comes to you, too. It is written. It is written that I'm loved. It is written that I'm accepted in the beloved. It is written. All throughout the word of God, we were taught. And this is what he said. Listen, this is what he prayed to his father. I'm not asking you to take them out of this world. I am asking you to keep them safe from the evil one. Those verses go on to say, the dot, 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 those verses go on to say that I was sent into this world, and now I'm sending them into this world. You and I were left here to take back the enemy's kingdom and to put God's kingdom first. Amen? So we're here, and what he accomplished was this. There is a pathway to Christ. There is a pathway to Christ. And we get to choose if we walk towards it or if we go our own way like Adam and Eve. If we're being attacked by the enemy, perhaps we're not on the right path. Are you with me? He's going to come, but we can defeat him. Let's take a look at this next verse. You know what's amazing? Uh, and I got to comment on this real quick. When Jesus defeated the enemy, what did he say again? It is what? Written. Remember what we talked about last week? Faith. Romans 10 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God, so every time you put the devil to flight, you build your faith. Can you say amen? Now, guys, let me share something with you. The next scripture is found in John 16, 33. Jesus said, in me, you will have peace. Why? Because he's the prince of peace. Can you say amen? Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble and suffering. Look, just because that we're, we're a believer... Because Christ is Lord of our life does not mean that we are immune to attacks from the enemy. Not the case. Watch this. But Jesus said, take courage. What? When you're in trouble, when you're suffering, Jesus said, take courage. Why? Come on, guys. Here's the good news. Because he has overcome the world. And you're going, okay, so Jesus overcame the world, and that's great, but I'm still here, and I'm still going through suffering, and I'm still going through trouble. So what does that do for me? What it does for us is this, is we have the ability and the authority to defeat the enemy when he comes to us with a lie. Right? You're not good enough. I cast that one down all the time. You don't know what you're doing. You're a fraud. I cast that down all the time. Girls, I'm not good enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not thin enough, I'm not whatever enough. Those lies come to us on a daily basis. And because of who we are in Christ, every time he comes to us and he brings up our past, and he says, well, you were a bulimic looking for love in all the wrong places. There is no way you could possibly pastor other people. You were a mess. If they had any idea who you used to be, you wouldn't be able to stand up there and tell them anything. And those are those moments that I get to realize that Jesus overcame the world. And when he went to the cross, he took all my junk with him. He took all of my pain, all of my sin, all of my shame, all of it. So when I go to the enemy, when he's talking to me, I talk back and I said, that's not who I am anymore. It's what I did, but it's not who I am. You see, he overcame the world and therefore I overcome the world. And that's what happens. Let's take a look at this next verse right here or this next picture. I love it. Your attitude when living as a Christian in a world full of evil and you know that God's in control. Are you looking at that? That's a man sitting in a boat and he is undisturbed by all of the mess that's around him. And I want you to know that when we have Jesus in our heart, like the question said, we can hang out in the midst of an evil world and understand that we have authority in Christ. We have authority in Christ. That even though those things are coming, even though debt is lurking, even though all of those things are going on around us, we can be sure of who he is. And we can be sure that even though this world may be evil, and even though people might come against us, and even though persecutions may come, 
we can know who we are in Christ and we can stand in that and we don't have to be persuaded one way or the other. You know, let, let me piggyback on something real quick, which I love. I love the fact that she says the enemy will always try to bring up your past. But how many know that in Christ we're a new creation? Amen. So the past is the past at last. Amen. But here's the cool part. When he brings up your past, you know what can happen when you become a new person, when you become a believer in Christ, your past can be a platform to preach to people from what you used to do and who you used to be. In other words, when you go through and you pass the test, you got a testimony. Come on, guys. Then when the enemy tries to remind you of the mess that you're in, you can take that mess and through Christ, it can become your message. See, the devil's got a scheme, but God's got a plan. Let me share something with you real quickly. Even though you and I live in a fallen world with a devil who wants to devour us, we do not have to walk in fear, and we don't have to be afraid. That was a weak amen. Come on, guys. Let me share some verses with you real quickly, and i got to tell you, these get me excited. 1 John 4, 4 says, The one who lives in you is greater or he's stronger than the one who is in the world. In other words, if Jesus is the Lord of your life, the devil cannot do anything without the permission from God. Amen. Isaiah 54, 7 says, no weapon. No weapon. Come on, get this, guys. No weapon formed against you will succeed or it will not prosper. Can you say amen? amen. amen. Let's go to the next verse. Psalms 34, 19, the Lord's people may suffer a lot. Did you get that? We are not immune to temptation. We are not immune to attacks. Come on, the Lord's people may suffer a lot, but he will always bring them safely through. Another translation says, many are the persecutions of the righteous, but God will deliver us from them all. 1 Peter 5, 10, you will suffer for a while, but God will will make you complete, steady, strong, and firm. Can I tell you today, sometimes you got to go through the fire for a purification process so that when you stand on the other side and people want to know if God is real and if God can help you, then you can testify that I went through hell and high water, but I'm still standing. Come on, guys. All right, we're going to wrap this up by understanding that the attacks of the enemy, they come from two different places. Just like with Jesus, they came from the enemy from the outside, right? They came from temptation. So here's um, two of the ways that the enemy comes and then how we defeat him. The first place the enemy attacks is from without. He attacks us through our circumstances. Have you been there, anybody? Through our trials, our troubles, our tribulations, and through our temptations. Now, speaking of temptations, let's look at this. This is God Almighty speaking to Cain, the firstborn person to Adam and Eve when they were kicked out of the garden because of sin. Here's what God said to Cain. Sin is crouching at your door. That's a scary thought. Waiting to attack you. Longing to destroy you. Then God said, but you must rule over it. Listen to me, guys. Let me give you some divine revelation. If you don't rule over it, it will rule over you. You know, in 20 years of ministry, um, it's pretty often that someone will come and say, the enemy is just attacking. He's attacking in my finances. He's attacking in my marriage. He's attacking in this area. And they put so much focus on what the enemy is busy doing not recognizing that they entered in to a place where they were fair game for the enemy to kick their butt. And this is what I mean by that. This pathway right here, God gives us his word, and in his word, he says that we're supposed to forgive. That's a hard one. But he says that I'll give you the power to forgive. He doesn't just tell us to do it. He says I'll give you the power to do that. 
He says in this, in this word, he says, I, I, I want you to forgive others as I have forgiven you in this pathway. He tells us to stay away from sin and to stay away from, from, um, from so many things. We look in the word and it gives us a direct understanding even how to do marriage. It tells me how to be a wife, that I'm supposed to submit myself to my husband. That doesn't mean that I become a doormat. It, becomes, it, it means this, that I recognize that my husband is listening to God. And that if he's listening to God, that I'm going to follow him. It means that the Bible tells us how to be a husband, to love your wife like Christ loved the church. It tells us how to do our finances. It tells us to give. It tells us um, to tithe. It tells us what to do in his word. And that is the path. Here's the problem, though. If we're walking in this path, we can understand that we are under the covering of Almighty God. And if you come to me and you say, Satan's just kicking my butt. Well, what happened? Well, I moved in with my boyfriend. And, uh, and, you know, and, 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 you know, we just, we don't have the money to tithe and we really haven't, you know, and now we're financial problems and now we're fighting all the time. Here's the deal. The Bible tells us how to live our lives. And when we step out of that, we are fair game for the enemy to kick her tail. We're outside of this place and blaming the enemy, but we have stepped out of that. Sin is crouching at your door waiting and longing to destroy you, but you must rule over it. You know how we rule over it? Lord, I'm going to get back in your perfect will, and I'm going to ask you, Father, to protect me and watch over me and guide me and lead me. Sometimes those attacks come from without, but it's not always the enemy. Sometimes we step into those problems. We get ourselves into financial problems, and you know what happens? The Bible tells us how to manage our money, and we'll do it our own way and then blame, on, blame it on the enemy. Right? Yeah, some of our wounds are self-inflicted. Y'all are getting quiet, so you don't like me. That's all right. I'll keep going. <laughs> Sin is crouching at your door. We're supposed to walk this path. If we walk this path and we follow God's word, we're under his covering and God will fight our battles for us. When we step out of the will of God and we start doing life our own way, leaving God out of it, we can't blame the enemy. We've got to take a look and understand that our problems may be coming from without, but perhaps it's because we entered into something. God says to forgive and all of a sudden somebody in our family does something against us and hurts our feelings. And we stand out here and we go, I'm not going to forgive. I'm not going to forgive. They don't deserve forgiveness. I'm not going to do it. And all of a sudden now you have family discord. And now all of a sudden you have issues. Are you with me? Because we've got to get back in alignment, okay? I'm back in alignment. I'm going to forgive. And somehow, some way, God works that out and through. Let's take a look at this picture real quick. I love this, and we're going to wrap this up. Ships don't sink because of the water around them. They sink because of the water that gets in them. Don't let what's happening around you get inside of you and weigh you down. Are you with me? Sin puts holes in our boat and begins to weigh us down. Walking outside of God's will and doing it our way put, puts holes in our boats and allows what's going on the outside to get on the inside. And the attacks of the enemy, they come from within. Guys, most of the, the battles that I fought in my life are not from the outside, they're from the inside. Because the Bible says this in Psalm 143 and 3, Satan is the enemy of our souls. It's important to know what your soul is comprised of. You ready? We may do a whole teaching on this. It's comprised of your will. The enemy is after your will. He's after your will to come off of God's plan for your life and to go in this direction in his way. It was his plan from the beginning. It was plan his plan in the garden, and it's his plan now. He wants your will. You and I can will ourselves to stop serving God. You and I can will ourselves to pull out and pull away from him and disconnect. Our will is made up of our emotions. Oh, dear Lord. Satan is the enemy of our emotions. You know what he does? He makes us emotional basket cases causing and creating drama within our families, within our homes, within our churches, within our lives. He uses our emotions to convince us that just because we're sad means maybe God's not working for us. You've prayed and he's not answered, so therefore he doesn't love you. And all of a sudden, we'll go from a spiritual high to an absolute low. Are you with me? He uses and manipulates our emotions. He uses and manipulates our, my, our imaginations. <laughs> Here's the deal. There are times in 20 years of marriage, I, I'm, I'm sure... That he woke up and said, what in the world have I married? 
There are times in my life while we're fighting. I was going to say something cute, but you know what? We fight. We do. <laughs> I'm a knockdown drag out. I'm a hit below the belt. And God had to change that in me. And here's the deal. Sometimes when you're in the throes of that, the enemy can come in and he can use your imagination to start wondering what it would be like if you were with this person over here. Oh, the grass is always greener on the other side. Is anybody with me? And you're right, it is. But when you get over there, you're still going to have to mow it and it's going to get weeds. That's what the enemy does is he comes in and he uses our emotions, he uses our, uh, our imagination, he uses our memory to pull us back into the past instead of going forward, and he uses our intellect, and he sometimes makes us so smart that we're so smart for God that we decide that we're going to do things on our own. The enemy attacks us from without and from within. Satan is the enemy of our souls, and we'll wrap up on this. Here's the good news. Psalm 23 and 3 says that God is the restorer of our souls. See, he may be the enemy of our souls, but God is the restorer of our souls. He can restore you from the inside out. James 4, 7 says this, Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. I love it. Great verse. Here's the deal. We a lot of times use the second part of that verse, and you'll come to your pastor and you'll say, Man, I've been resisting the devil, but he just won't go away. He's kicking my butt. And we'll always say this. What's the first part of that verse say? It says submit yourself to God. It means submit yourself. It means get into alignment with what God says. When we do that first, then we have the authority to fight the enemy. Are you with me? We can't be out of the will of God fighting the enemy. We have to be submitted to God, give him our hearts, give him our lives. And then the Bible says in Luke 10 that nothing can hurt us. We have the authority and the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. It goes on to say that nothing by any means shall hurt you. We don't have to be afraid of the enemy, but we are his target. Why? Because we're supposed to be busy doing God's work. We're going to wrap this up today by having us understand why does the enemy attack us if Jesus lives in our heart? Simple, because Jesus lives in our heart. He's going to attack us. But fear not, because Jesus has overcome the world. Amen. 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 We're going to go to prayer right now, and we're just going to ask the Lord to continue to speak to us. We're going to ask the Lord just to continue to remind us, you know, perhaps today some of the struggles that you're going through, perhaps it's just as simple as starting with the very last verse I gave you. Perhaps it's just because we're not submitted to God. Maybe we're living in a way that, that discounts what God did. Maybe we're living in a way that we are not under the authority. We're not using our authority against the enemy. Why? Because we're really not submitted to God. We're not living for him. Maybe there's unforgiveness in our heart. Maybe there's some things going on in our lives. And the fact of the matter is, is we're outside of the perfect will of God trying to fight the enemy and wondering why he's attacking. We need to first submit our hearts and our lives to God and say, Lord, forgive me change me. You see where I'm at. God, help me to get lined up with you, what you want for my life. When I do that, I can take the authority over the enemy. I can use the Lord's name, and I could take back what the devil stole from me. Friends, we don't have to live our lives afraid of what the enemy brings. We don't have to be afraid of persecution. We don't have to be afraid of those things that come. We could be like that man in that boat while everything is circling. We know who we are. We know whose we are. And therefore, we know that our God will fight our battles. We also have to have the wisdom to be able to say, Lord, are all these things circling because there's something in my life that you want to get out? If there is, Lord, take it. Father, place in order what is out of order in my life so that I have the strength to fight. God is a good God. And Jesus came to this earth to give us and to leave us power over the enemy. He's not pulling us out of this world, but he gives us the empowerment we need to overcome this world, overcome trials and tribulations, to overcome the enemy. And he wants us to walk in that authority today.
John 10, 10 says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus in the latter part of that verse said, but I yes. have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Guys, I want to read you a definition to submit if I could quickly. Remember James 4, 7, one of the most misquoted verses in all the Bible. We always say resist the devil and he'll flee. But you can tell the devil no all day long hmm. and he ain't going anywhere unless you do the first part of the verse that says submit yourself to God. The definition for submit, watch this, means to accept or yield to a superior force. God is the utmost superior force. It says accept or yield to a superior force or to the authority of or will of an another person. That's the missing component right there, submitting to God. That's what we got to do. In order to make the enemy leave us alone, and by the way, for a time or for a season, when Jesus was tempted, the Bible says the enemy left him for a season. He's coming back, but that's all right. That's okay. Let him come back because you've been given the power through the word, right? Through the word which builds your faith to put him to flight. So we're going to have a time of prayer in just a few seconds. And let me ask you a couple of questions. Let's just be honest today and... Man, I, I got to tell you, I'm excited, super excited, that is, about this series because we're going to break it down. We, we've deemed this series as basic building blocks for believers. We're going to get back to the basics. Any question you have, we'd love to answer, please, before you leave. If you've got something you want to you wanna write down, please put it in the box, and we will try to hit on that in the next upcoming weeks. And we're going to build a whole sermon series. Nothing is off limits. Guys, we're going to go ahead and pray, but before we do, I want every head bowed and every eye closed. Are you here today and you say, you know what, man, the enemy has been whipping my butt. I got a, I got a huge bullseye that looks like it belongs on the store of Target on my back. That every time I walk out of the house or roll out of bed, I am attacked. You're getting your brains beat in every day at work. You seem like you never have any victory because you're always walking in defeat. There's a place at this altar for you. And I believe that God's going to touch you. I believe that God's going to renew your mind. And he's going to set your heart in motion. And you're going to find out what it is to walk in victory. Remember, you can be out of the will of God. Or you can be in the will of God. It's your choice. But before we go any further, let me ask you this. Are you here today and you don't know the Jesus that we spoke about in a personal relationship? Maybe you've heard about him, you've read about him, or you've saw some special on TV. But he's not the Lord of your life. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, I want to extend an invitation to you. Can I tell you plainly and very bluntly, it is hell without Jesus. Amen. But it's heaven with him. So you're here today and you've got this crazy feeling in your stomach. It's twisting and turning. Maybe your heart's beating out of your chest. I would be the first person to say, good. That's the Holy Ghost working inside of you, preparing your heart to receive the Lord. Are you here today? And let me say this, no one's looking around. No one's going to judge you or think anything bad about you. But are you here today and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior? Or maybe you have accepted Him, but, but tragedy and, and troubles and trials and, and tribulations have caused you to take your eyes off of Him and place them elsewhere. And you feel like you've lost your way. You need to find your way back. If I'm speaking to you, guys, I want you to quickly raise your hand. I want to pray for you. If I'm speaking to you, if that, if, if that what I just said applied to you, I'd like to pray for you in just a second. Are you here today? And you say, I need Jesus. I'm battling every day of my life. I've, I've lost my way. I need him. Moving on, are you here today? You say, you know what, man? I'm tired of walking in defeat. If the Bible says that I'm the head, not the tail, the top, not the bottom, the first, not the last, then I want to live that way and I want to walk in that. You're tired of being beat up and beat down by the enemy. Today, you're ready to walk in victory. You're ready to learn how. If I'm speaking to you, I want you to quickly raise your hand. Come on, let me see your hands.
Your prayer that today is that God will renew a right mind in you. Is that your prayer today? Amen. That God will place a new heart in you so that we can have a heart after the Lord. God bless you. Thank you. Anybody else? Come on. Let me see your hands. We're going to pray in just a second. Amen. Amen. Guys, John is fixing to play this song again. And, and if you have a need whatsoever, Pastor Jennifer and myself will be right here at this altar. And the invitation is open. If you need something from the Lord, today's your day. Don't you leave home or to go home without it. If you leave today without your breakthrough, let me say this. It's your fault, not the Lord's. In Jesus' name.